I finally got my uh, passport. Had to delay my flight by two days. Cost Matthew and I both each $250. So that was pretty awesome. I'm at the rental place in Portland. Portland's kind of a block of ice right now. And I finally got my adorable little roller skate gutless wonder of a Prius. We're gonna see how, how it goes. I'm trying to get down to Matthews in Hornbrook, California. Okay, well, we left about 12 o'clock and drove straight down to San Francisco in the middle of the night and got here about 6.15 or something and turned in a rental car, got on a shuttle, got to the airport, got checked in and um, got boarding passes and um, so now we're just about 20 minutes shy of getting on the plane. What's the funniest thing that's happened so far? Me, me driving in the rain in the dark in a car I never drove before. <laughs> You have a hard competition. <laughs> this is my Uncle Matthew, the most well-traveled person I know, a legend of our time, and one of my favorite people in the world. He taught English in China on and off for about seven years, and when I heard he was going back, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to join him. I'm going to China! <laughs> After a 15-hour flight from San Francisco, we caught a bus from the airport into downtown Kowloon, which is an urban area in Hong Kong. There we found our guest house that we looked up in our Lonely Planet book and settled in. We spent a few days just tripping around the city, seeing the sights, eating the food and meeting the people. We stayed in a super cool hostel full of other world travelers and made preparations for the next leg of our journey to Guilin in mainland China. After a couple of light rail trains to the border, and once we crossed into China proper and went through all the customs and immigration crap, we found out that the train tickets we bought online to Guilin while we were in Hong Kong were no good. So they gave us our money back and we spent over an hour waiting in line at the train station to buy tickets for the next train during which time they all sold out and the next train wasn't till two days later. In the meantime, we shacked up in a youth hostel in the beautiful little city of Shenzhen. And by little, I mean about 12 million people. This hostel in Shenzhen is absolutely incredible. I'm sitting here in the common area, plate of fresh pork dumplings right here, large beer for a dollar. I paid 20 kwai, which translates to a little over three dollars. Jiao zha. You pour some brown vinegar on here, or dip it in this chili sauce. There you go. I don't ever want to leave China. Mm. I miss my friends and my family, but <laughs> come on. You know. I just went to the bank to go exchange some more money. This place is amazing. It's full of all these little side streets and tiny noodle shops and Chinese banyan trees with all these roots growing down off them. Traffic here is very interesting. Electric motorbikes everywhere. Everyone's constantly honking their horns at each other and moving around other people, cutting each other off. No one's going very fast, but a lot of aggressive driving. I like it. I'm in China. Our new friend Lili, who was also a guest at the hostel and who happened to speak fantastic English, which is rare for a native Chinese person, helped us book another hostel in a little fishing village about two hours drive southeast of Guilin called Xingping. With our train tickets and hostel reserved, it was finally time, once again, to go back to the train station and continue on our journey. This is the Shenzhen North Railway Station, a gargantuan train depot whose size compares to a US airport and whose wait times make the DMV look like a slow day at an antique shop. 
We missed our train because Matthew had to go back through security when he went outside to smoke. We waited in line for an hour to get a refund. Wrong line. An hour in the next line. Too late now to get a refund. Close to another hour in another line to buy more tickets for the next day. Back to the hostel we went for another day. It sucked. Believe it or not though, at this point, we actually caught the train the next day and were finally on our way to Guilin. The train was actually pretty cool too. It was comfortable, quite speedy, and incredibly smooth on the tracks. We arrived in Guilin three hours later, grabbed a couple of scrumptious steam buns and some savory deep fried dough of some sort at the train station, and found a ride share to get us to Yangshuo. There's no, there's no lights, no signals. Really? No. Yeah. yeah. Just, you just go when you can. You guys work it out yourselves. <laughs> then on two more bumpy buses and past someone's wrecked car before we finally arrived in the quaint historic fishing village of Xingping. Saying Xingping is beautiful is like saying the Beatles were popular. It's a flagrant understatement. At first glance, this little town may seem like any other in rural China, a peaceful community of fishermen and farmers hawking their produce yields and goods at the local market, pulling taffy, you know, just living the simple life. Although its modesty and old world charm are reason enough to visit, the real splendor of this area lies in the stunning geological environment in which it is set. As far as the eye can see, massive haystack-style limestone rock formations cover the landscape, some reaching well over 300 meters in height. These formations, known as karsts, were formed from fossilized prehistoric seafloor sediments millions of years ago. When the crashing of tectonic plates formed the Himalayas, the seafloor was pushed up, exposing the alkaline limestone to the acidic rains of this subtropical climate. The water slowly dissolved the limestone and percolated into subterranean rivers, vast caverns, and sinkholes that caused the water tables to drop and the ground's surface layer to sink. This in turn caused the formation of karst peaks. All right, let's go cormorant fishing. Cormorant fishing is a traditional fishing method in which the fishermen use trained cormorant birds to fish in rivers. We begin at dusk. Dating back over a thousand years in China and Japan, this ancient fishing technique uses a snare tied near the base of the bird's throat, which prevents it from swallowing large fish. While still able to breathe easily and swallow the small fish, the large fish are held in the bird's throat and retrieved by the fisherman when he gets the bird back on the boat. Though cormorant fishing was once a successful profession, its primary use today is to serve the tourism industry. This entire trip, halfway across the world, is completely worth it for these dumplings alone. Amazing. Everything here, in fact, was amazing. Our hostel room with two beds, a flat screen TV, air conditioning, a bathroom with a shower in it, and a view from our porch overlooking the Lee River was how much? About $20 a night. One morning, Matthew had to go run a couple of errands, so I grabbed my camera, after dumplings of course, and went exploring. So I decided to just walk up some random alleyway and found this big stone staircase that I'm now hiking up and I have no idea where it leads to. You can't quite see it from this angle, but those are the stairs going up, zigzagging back and forth up the hill. There are a lot more than I expected. I see what looks like, what look like power lines or something, so 
there might be something at the top. This staircase seems to be leading up and around uh, one of these karst limestone formations. It was. I was hiking to the very tip top of that right hand peak, which was literally across the street from our hostel. Xingping is over 1700 years old, and it looks like these stone stairs were just carved right out of the side of the mountain. It's incredible. Incredible, but not true. Although it was settled in 265 AD, the locals informed me that the stairs were built by the Chinese in the 1900s with help from the Japanese, which was rare considering their sordid relationship. These stairs are getting a lot steeper. We're up into the fog now. With red painted arrows showing me the way, I trudged into the mist up the hill on narrow, slippery, winding staircases, up ladders, and through super cool looking archways. There's gotta be something at the top of this. It looks like all the power lines were for this uh, radio tower, or cell phone tower or something. But there's this pavilion behind me. When I got to the top, I finally looked out and I saw this. On our last night in Xingping, we feasted once again at our favorite dumpling shop, which we had visited almost a dozen times over the course of four or five days. This night was special though, because while we were eating dinner, our conversation began drowning in a cacophony of yelling at an adjacent table. The owner invited Matthew and I over to his table where these blue collar guys were carousing the night away playing this finger guessing game that involves two people, each one throwing out different number values with their fingers. Every time a player throws, they shout out a predicted sum to try and guess the total of the two numbers shown by their hands. It's kind of like rock, paper, scissors. The first player to guess the total wins the round and the other player has to take a sip of this homemade rice whiskey called Baijiu that they served from an old Gatorade bottle and is commonly referred to among the Chinese as white lightning. They also added what I could only assume at the time to be chicken liver oil or something. I guess it's supposed to help your hangover. It didn't and it was not tasty at all. But they were constantly throwing fresh greens and chicken feet on the hot plate and giving us one of the greatest samples of local culture I've ever witnessed or been a part of. We could not have asked for a better send off from this, one of the most magical places I've ever been. It was such a kick in the pants. More planes, trains, and automobiles to get to the charming capital city of the Sichuan province, Chengdu, where we had reserved a room at the Dragon Town Guest House in the heart of the city. We checked in and then went out. This little shop sold the best steam buns I've ever had. They were stuffed full of pork, garlic, ginger, good stuff, and they were only a buck a piece. And of course, we were always hunting for dumplings. These dumplings are amazing. Once again, this entire trip to China is worth it for a bowl of dumplings. 
Mm. Mm. And speaking of food, we also stumbled across this incredible market right in the middle of the city. This place was like a chef's wet dream. They had everything here, it seemed. Well, no cats or dogs. I checked. Yet another unique slice of culture. We were also treated to a sumptuous dinner by one of Matthew's former students in a neighboring town referred to as the Minority Village due to its high populations of various Chinese minorities. We feasted on a smorgasbord of delicious food and drink, and I finally got to eat some bugs. The bamboo worms were particularly tasty. I'm eating a locust, deep fried locust. <laughs> And it's wonderful. <laughs> Bamboo worms. Bee larva. We also took part in some sort of drinking ceremony that I imagine is customary for this minority. We drank a bunch of rose wine. It was great. While the city was really cool, the reason we came here was not for what was in the city, but for what was in the mountains. From Chengdu, we hopped on a bus that dropped us off right outside the city of Lishan at Lingyun Mountain. Lingyun Mountain is located within the Mount Ume scenic area which has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1996 and is home to one of the most spectacular monuments in the world. Up the stairs we climbed, awing at the many beautiful stone carvings, stopping to admire the expert craftsmanship of artisans long past, and anticipating a truly astounding piece of ancient Chinese history. This is the Lashan Giant Buddha. Completed in 803, this massive 233-foot stone statue is over 1,300 years old. It is the largest and tallest stone Buddha statue in the world, and is by far the tallest pre-modern statue ever built. Carved right into the side of the mountain, construction began in 713 and was led by a Chinese monk named Hai Tong, who reportedly gouged his own eyes out to show his piety and dedication to the project when funding was threatened by the government. After his death, construction of the statue was halted for about 70 years due to insufficient funding. A regional military governor stepped in to fund the completion by Hai Tong's disciples in 803. Built at the confluence of three rivers, Hai Tong hoped that the Buddha's presence would allow safe passage of shipping vessels that were plagued by the turbulent waters there. Interestingly enough, the massive construction resulted in so much stone being removed from the cliff face and deposited into the river below that the currents were indeed altered by the statue, making the waters safe for passing ships. It is a sacred destination to many Buddhist pilgrims and attracts millions of tourists every year from all corners of the globe. For well over a millennium, great care by countless devoted people and organizations has been taken to construct, maintain, and preserve the Lashan Giant Buddha, a truly magnificent ancient wonder of the world. So after our 19 hour train ride from Chengdu to Kunming, we're on our way to our hostel finally. The girl at the hostel in Chengdu gave me the name in Chinese characters for the hostel in Kunming. But when we got to the bus station, after we got off the train, we couldn't catch a cab. We had to call the hostel in Chengdu and then ask some employees at the bus station how to get 
to our hostel. So they put us on a number two bus and it's about probably 28 degrees out here. We're freezing our asses off. But good news, we just got to our hostel. <sighs> Known as the city of eternal spring for its pleasant, moderate climate and flowers that bloom all year long, Kunming is the largest city in and the capital of the Yunnan province. We just happened to arrive during what was said to be one of the coldest winters they had had in decades. It's freezing here in Kunming, so we decided to stop by this sidewalk fire and warm ourselves for a little bit. Just on the sidewalk. Go figure. After three weeks of nothing but dumplings, noodles, and fried rice, I'm ready for a chicken club sandwich with french fries. You can smoke on these buses, because the driver is, so I am. The next morning, we set out northwest of Kunming, up Yuan Mountain, to an old Buddhist temple called Bamboo Temple. Established during the Yuan Dynasty in the 13th and 14th centuries, Bamboo Temple was the first temple in Yunnan dedicated to Zen Buddhism. It has since been burned down and reconstructed several times with the present structure dating from the late Qing Dynasty, which was the last Imperial Chinese Dynasty before the country became the Republic of China in 1912. The temple is most renowned for the painted clay sculptures of the 500 Buddhist Arhats. In Sanskrit, the word arhat translates to mean one who is worthy, and referred to in Buddhism as someone who is spiritually enlightened. Each arhat is about a meter tall and is characterized by a unique facial expression and body gesture. The sculptures are distributed over three buildings. 216 each are in the Fanyin Pavilion and Tian Tai Lai Pavilion, and 68 are housed in the temple's main hall, the Da Xiang Hall. Photography in these rooms was strictly prohibited, so I had Matthew stand outside and keep an eye on the monk who was distracted by her iPhone while I captured all the footage you're seeing now. As Matthew and I wandered the grounds, taking photos and marveling at the impressive architecture, a man sitting out front of his apartment across the courtyard called us over to him. He gave us cookies, said some Chinese stuff, and then he put on his leg. Yeah, his leg. Indicating that we follow him, he led us all the way out of the temple complex and up the road. We made a friend. We thought he was taking us up to the bus stop at the top of the hill but he wasn't. He took us on a walk up to, we didn't know where, but now we are here, and it is a brand new, newly made, but still under construction temple complex with a huge giant Buddha. got to see some of the sculptures being painted in real time and uh, it just knocks our socks off. It's just been so incredible and we're like this place isn't even open yet and and here we are 
and he even took some fruit off of the offering table and, and we're eating it. Uh, I guess he's allowed because he seems to know his way around here. He lives here and I don't know what his job is, but there's some kind of a cookie with a filling inside. Here's a new interesting fruit that I have no idea what it is. It looks like a little apple. Mm. It's some kind of like a, a plum or something. So that's where you say tourists know where they're going, but travelers know where they've been. The next leg of our journey was about 500 kilometers northwest of Kunming to the city of Lijiang. We left our hostel too late and missed our flight, so we had to buy new tickets and take a later flight. It sucked, but... And it's better than a sharp stick in the eye, and we've been through worse. Matthew got slapped on the wrist for trying to smuggle his lighter in his sock when passing through security, but we made it to Lijiang. We just got off the bus in Lijiang, and we we're hungry, so we sniffed out the first dumpling place we could find. So now we're going to indulge in a, a nice big bowl of jiaozi. We're in jiaozi heaven. And I mean, there's like at least two dozen jiaozi on here. So you better not eat mine, goddammit. <laughs> Welcome to Lijiang. Time for a montage. As you can plainly see, Lijiang is simply enchanting. The historical center of the city is commonly called the Old Town of Lijiang and is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The town's history goes back more than a thousand years and the Old Town part of the city is famous for its orderly system of waterways and bridges. At night, the city lights up, comes alive and vibrates with music, buzzes with shoppers and tourists, and smells like food. Good food, and lots of it. If you aren't hungry by now, you're about to be. I suppose it goes without saying that we had ridiculous fun. It's a pretty awesome hostel here in Lijiang. Uh, the facilities are more than adequate. The staff is extremely helpful and friendly and English speaking, which is a plus in our book. And we got bus tickets to Chaotou in the morning. Our travels from Kunming to Lijiang and Lijiang to Chaotou led us here, to one of our major destinations for this trip, the Tiger Leaping Gorge. At 12,434 feet from mountain peak to river, the Tiger Leaping Gorge is one of the deepest and most spectacular river canyons in the world. The gorge received its name from an ancient Chinese legend. The story tells of a tiger who was stranded on a rock in the middle of the churning river. In order to escape a hunter, the tiger leapt a great distance across the remainder of the river to safety. Right before we started hiking, this guy uh, offered us some horse rides for 50 quai apiece. 
we said no. So now it seems like he's been following us for the past quarter mile or so, probably banking on us getting tired. We're wondering if our friend with the horses is gonna continue on walking after us or go back and wait for the next bus to try to get some business. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out what people are talking about. This nice gentleman is selling Red Bull up here. It's Ten Kwai for a little can. Comes in a gold can. It's cold too. We just got to this wide spot in the trail, oh. taking a rest, and the guy told me, hey, sit down. Offered me a bag of weed here. <laughs> Said, hey, ganja, ganja, which is not Chinese, it's, it's Hindi, it's from India. But actually, I mean, it's all. Yeah, I mean, it's green, but it's little buds. I mean, look at that. <laughs> These guys, they always look for people that look like me, you know. <laughs> well, after about an hour and a half, our buddy finally left. The majority of the inhabitants of the gorge are the indigenous Nashi people, who live in a handful of small hamlets and whose subsistence primarily comes from grain production and money from hikers. They also use the trail on a daily basis. Although you can hike the 22 kilometer trail, about 14 miles in one day, we elected to spend two and a half days to do it so we could take our time to really soak up all the beauty of this place. Ah, the beauty of nature, the high mountain peaks, the pine trees, the glories of being outdoors. And then we have this. The first world meets the third world. Garbage heaven. Garbage aside, it really was incredibly majestic. Oh, it's just so beautiful in China. I love it. Be still my beating heart. On and on we hiked, constantly stopping to take photos and video. I mean, wouldn't you? After, I don't know, four or five hours or so, we arrived in some super tiny village and checked into a hostel there. It was totally awesome. You hike all day and then kick back with a beer and a bowl of fried rice. You can't beat it, especially when this is the view from your room. I drank some really weak Chinese beer with some really fun Europeans, and then we jumped back on the trail the next morning. So this is the 28 bends part of the trail. Apparently, it raises 2,500 feet in elevation within these 28 turns. I think I'm about halfway through. It's pretty gnarly. There's this little bird that's been flying ahead of me a little ways and then stopping, and then flying ahead of me and stopping again. I secretly wish that it's like a anthropomorphized sympathetic character that's helping me along the way you know like in a Disney movie after a few hours of hiking we descended into a serene countryside valley and shacked up here at the Nashi family guest house our room wasn't much but we didn't need much this place is absolutely incredible This place was pure magic. It had such an agrarian, pastoral quality to it, and the whole area just struck me with such awe and majesty that I instantly and completely fell in love.
the public bus here in Quinming, there's a sound before each stop, and it sounds exactly like when you get an extra life in Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. But the important it's pretty question awesome. is, who gives a shit? Sorry. We flew back to Kunming because plane tickets to Bangkok were cheaper there, but everybody and their mother was flying because it was Chinese New Year. We decided to save a few hundred dollars by taking a series of buses instead. Pretty tight quarters on this bus. My sleeper bed is literally as wide as I am, and no more. But hey, look, we got this adorable little blanket. See, they got little lambs on them and everything. Oh my god, she's got a lollipop too. Hey, at least they're showing a movie. They're showing true lies in English. We've been on the bus for about 10 hours now. And uh, periodically our surly driver will pull over and yell at us in Chinese. We got pulled over by, I guess, some police and they got checked all our passports. But there's guys with guns around. So I gotta be careful. Uh, I'm actually not even sure if we're in Thailand or China. I think we're still in China. So I guess this is the bus to Mohan. We're not even in Mohan yet. These buses have no room to speak of on them and Steel they're pretty grungy. Well, we just got off the bus in Mohan and the lady behind the desk told us that there's no bus to Thailand. No bus. So Matthew called his friend Shirley and Shirley informed us that we, in order to catch a bus, need to walk to Laos. Which sounds crazy, but Laos apparently is only about 200 meters away. So in the meantime, we're having some breakfast. And these mango drinks are amazing. They even got little chunks of mango in them. Ah, oh, so good. Welcome to Laos. At this point, we were stranded. As we schlepped our luggage along the road toward a bus station with no buses, a miracle happened. A newlywed couple from Kunming on their honeymoon stopped and picked us up. They drove us three and a half hours through the northwestern corner of Laos to the Thai border and wouldn't even accept any money from us. They were heaven sent. After more customs and immigration crap and 30 straight hours of travel, we were finally in Thailand. Welcome to Chiang Mai. I'm certain that this is not indicative of the entire country or the culture at large. I was only in this city for a few days. But from my very limited experience, culturally speaking, Thailand was a far cry from the traditionalism of China. It seemed like the influx of American and European tourists gave the city much more of a party vibe and brought out the elasticity of the culture. There were brothels everywhere fronting as bars and massage parlors and scores of 20-something Americans partying, getting hammered, and trying to have sex with each other. Hi, right, what's up everyone? I'm Kevin. We're here in Northern Thailand in Chiang Mai. I met Elijah at our hostel. Well, the So Hostel is pretty legit, cool area. A lot of hookers if you're interested. Uh, so right now we're drinking uh, Chang. It's a great classic lager, one of the popular ones here. Uh, something cool I learned about actually is uh, they don't regulate their alcohol uh, percentage. So it says on the bottle 5.5%, but it could be anywhere from 5.5 to, I've heard, up to 11% alcohol. So a funny word, it's called the Changover. Uh, if you have a couple too many, you might feel pretty shitty the next day. It's Chinese New Year here in Chiang Mai. So, Sawati Pi Mai. Happy New Year in Thai. Thai food to die for. Hot Thai and shrimp and eggs and everything. And we love Thai food, but we couldn't resist Rockies because 
These burgers just look absolutely killer. I mean, they're about an inch thick and they come with everything. This is not fast food, but it's cheap and it looks delicious. We're in heaven at Rocky's, man. Rocky's rocks. Mm. That is sensational. We decided to do our own things for a couple days, so we rented some motorcycles and Matthew went off to the city of Pi and I went about 50 miles north. Now I'm headed up to Changgao, meet up with my friend Kelly, rented this super sweet scooter. I get 70 miles to the gallon on this hog. Do you still want to go to Aspen? And this is my friend Kelly. Say hi, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Kelly was teaching English in Singapore. She had some time off and invited me to a music festival here in Changdao. Down the road from the festival, Kelly had rented an adorable little bungalow at this farm stay on a gorgeous rambutan orchard. It was paradise. <laughs> We're going to a music festival! More great memories and epic adventures in the jungle, but it was time to head south. Cheers, buddy. Hasta pronto. Get your ass over here. Back in Chiang Mai, Matthew and I reconnected and took a brutal 12-hour bus ride south to Bangkok, where we stayed for a night. I said, you meet great people on the road. That's because the boring people stay at home. Welcome to Bangkok. <laughs> What a city. The main tourist attraction here is Koh San Road. In addition to the mouth-watering cuisine you can find on nearly every block, Koh San Road also offers quite a selection of various forms of entertainment that you not only might not find in the States, but were sometimes just weird sounding. Rainbows and shooting bananas? And what's a magic razor blade? I mean, how would you put... To eat a deep fried scorpion. It's actually not that bad. It looks more intimidating than it actually is. I said I wasn't going to do this. It is pretty repulsive, but I decided that, hey, you know, go big or stay at home, right? So, here I am, eating a scorpion. It gives you uh, lots of power. It's like crab. It's pretty hard, actually. Really crunchy. I wouldn't say it's bad. It's kind of like eating a walnut shell or something. <laughs> The adventurer in me steered me down some random alleyway where I stumbled upon this really charming little bar with live music. I ended up drinking whiskey and playing rummy for money with this cool Thai lady. Good morning! Now we're taking a bus, a nine hour bus to see him reap. Lots of fun! So we had to pay 1,400 baht for our visa and immigration to get into Cambodia, and then 100 baht to uh, pay for the photograph that we have to take, like a you know passport photo. But we didn't have to take any photos. It was actually just 100 baht to pay off the government or whoever is allowing us into Cambodia. Here in the beautiful little city of Siem Reap in northern Cambodia. We checked into yet another cheap but impressive hostel and went out on the town. Pub Street is the main drag here. 
where you can find a variety of bars and restaurants serving up delicious local cuisine, as well as some of the more exotic culinary adventures. This is a cockroach. Yeah. <laughs> no, not that. That's water. What's this? This is a cricket. Mm. I like the cricket better. Yeah, it's good. It's not as crunchy. Matthew's snake over here. According to a bunch of crap I just read on the internet, a lot of Americans are really afraid of spiders. You know, big spiders. Like this. Giant, deep fried tarantula. But we're not in America. We're in Cambodia. And in Cambodia, I fear no spider. It's what's for dinner. After eating our way around southern China for a month, and then through Thailand for a week, our journey was nearing its end. No trip to Southeast Asia, though, would be complete without visiting some of the most jaw-dropping relics of the ancient world, the temples in the city of Angkor. These are a few of the most magnificent temples of the Khmer civilization, a vast empire ahead of their time and widely known to this day for their advanced achievements in art, architecture, hydraulic infrastructure, and social and political organization. Of the over 1,000 temples built here during the Khmer Empire, the Bayan Temple of Angkor Thom, shown here, was built around the end of the 12th century and is among the most artistically and architecturally impressive temples of the period. No amount of historical information or photographic documentation can fully represent the feelings of actually being here, and I would need an entirely separate film to properly delve into the fascinating history of this time and region of the world. It's visceral and transcendent, like stepping into the past, and it's remarkably intact. From its rise in 802 AD until the fall of Angkor in the late 15th century, the Khmer Empire flourished for over 600 years. At its zenith, the empire's territory covered most of the mainland of Southeast Asia, and its greatest legacy and capital city was Angkor. Using modern techniques, including satellite photos, a team of international researchers recently concluded that at 1,000 square kilometers, about 390 miles squared, Angkor was the largest pre-industrial city in the world beginning in the 11th century up until the Industrial Revolution, and is said to have sustained a population of over 1 million Khmer people. This is Ta Pram. Constructed during the reign of King Jayavarman VII, who also built the Bayan Temple some years prior, Ta Pram's signature features are the trees growing out of the ruins, which offer beauty as well as structural integrity to some parts of the temple. Although a concerted effort has been put into stabilizing the ruins and permitting access, 
Its marriage to the jungle prompted the governing powers at the time to leave Tapram largely as it was found in order to maintain its condition of apparent neglect. It was also featured in the movie Tomb Raider with Angelina Jolie. And now I present to you the crown jewel of Cambodia, Angkor Wat. Magnificent, spectacular, mind-blowing, these adjectives are fruitless attempts to describe the indescribable. There is no other place on earth like Angkor Wat. Built over a period of 37 years during the reign of King Suryavarman II from 1113 to 1150, this temple is the largest religious monument in the world. It was built as the king's state temple and capital, dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, and designed to emulate Mount Meru, a sacred cosmological mountain considered by the Hindu to be the center of all the physical, metaphysical, and spiritual universes. It's not only mathematically balanced, but almost every surface from floor to ceiling to rooftop is ornately carved with one or another spectacular bas-relief. Surrounding the 2.2 mile perimeter wall of the temple is a 620 foot wide moat encompassing the entire 4 to 500 acre temple grounds which as well as helping to keep invaders at bay and minimizing the encroachment of the jungle over the centuries that the temple was abandoned, the moat kept the soil underneath the temple at a consistent moisture level which has allowed it to stay standing for close to 900 years because the whole thing is built on a floodplain. Otherwise, the soil would be full of gaps when the water recedes after the rainy season and the foundation of the temple would collapse. They also used the monumental amount of dirt they had displaced to build the moat to create three rectangular terraced galleries that rose successively to the central tower, like a layer cake of dirt and stone. The king employed the most talented sculptors and architects of the time to design and decorate the temple, and builders utilized a construction technique of rubbing the stones together with water to set them in place, which allowed them to build the entire temple without any mortar. Angkor Wat stands, frozen in time, as one of the greatest achievements in human history, and by far the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Now we are in a van riding to the airport to catch a flight to Chiang Mai. Now we are on an airplane to Chiang Mai. Now we are in Chiang Mai. It's over man, you know, we're putting this trip to bed. At least the Elijah and Matthew part. I'm still going for another month and a half. Matthew and I bid each other a fond farewell and I flew back to Hong Kong to catch my flight home to the good old U.S. of A. I was informed that the uh, flight from Hong Kong to San Francisco would not be full. So when I boarded the plane, I saw an empty seat in business class, and I took it. For a brief but decadent half hour, I felt what it must be like to be rich. Champagne, a flip-out screen, pop-up armrest, leg room, Oh, it was so awesome, but 
upon request of my boarding pass, I was not able to produce the correct boarding pass. So needless to say, I was uh, remanded back to coach where I was actually supposed to be. You know, I suppose it's not so bad back here. Uh, we got movies and dinner, and I have three drinks in front of me. Four countries, six weeks, 17 hostels, not enough dumplings, countless unforgettable memories, and only $3,500 total for all my expenses. A million thank yous go out to my uncle, Matthew Post, for ushering me into and sharing with me a legendary travel adventure that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life.